lights. I, I share the optimism of the panel. Obviously, um, from the city's gov city government's perspective, we are very bullish on the potential growth of this sector. But I also don't want to underestimate how hard this is. Um, the capital intensity, the time to market, the risk involved, particularly on the therapeutic side, of um, from you know the timeline from having a piece of science that can potentially develop, be developed into a new drug to actually seeing that drug in the market through clinical t trials is very very different from how entrepreneurship and startup works in a number of other sectors. And so I think you know one of the things we need to do, and we can talk more about this um, as the city in partnership with investors with real estate developers, with scientists, academics, um, and, and institutions is be really proactive about removing the barriers and reducing that risk so that we can have as many of these companies start and be successful here and get to market. Yeah, and we, we see that a lot. Um, you know, that this kind of science emerging from a university is incredibly early stage, and therefore it's about as early as you can get. It's often a really brilliant tech, uh, scientific insight and a paper and a patent maybe a couple of patents, and a f often, if you're lucky, a fantastic postdoc who's willing to go leave the university and join the company. Um, and so other, it's been an amazing run, just looking at it from Columbia's perspective. When I joined uh, 11 years ago, there were five or six patent-backed startups a year emerging from the university. In the last couple of years, we've had 20, 25, 28 every year. Um, but when people ask, what does it take to get these companies through that valley of death? The answer often has been everything. Having a great patent is part of it. Having dynamic scientists and their graduate students is part of it. Having real estate, um, access to capital. Um, but, but I think the city has really done, uh, uh, under both the, the Bloomberg administration, the Blasio administration, has really uh, embraced that idea that there's uh, a, a huge number of hurdles that still remain and to do everything possible to, to, to minimize the impact of those hurdles. So maybe, Ewan, if you think back on the last, when did you join the New York City sort of economic development scene? So originally in 2008. 2008, right. Yeah. So over the last nine or 10 years, what have been some of the initiatives that you've seen uh, that you think across the city, whether it's from the, from the partnership for New York City or from the academic institutions or from our, our uh, investors or our real estate folks or the EDC, that you think have made a, a difference in the growth of the ecosystem here? So I think um, from the academic institutions, and I think Gordana referenced this, certainly some of the leadership and culture change that's happened, um, more focus on uh, entrepreneurship and innovation, um, more focus on helping companies to start here, helping investigators who are interested in becoming entrepreneurs and founders um, to follow that path, and, and leadership in the academic medical centers um, from, from the most senior levels um, to create a more collaborative environment has been hugely important. Um, we have seen the entry of more risk capital and more experienced risk capital because it's not just about the money, it's about the knowledge and the mentorship and the networks and connections that come with that money. So um, uh, people coming into the ecosystem here in New York and providing access to all of those things. We're seeing now significantly sized A rounds, which I don't think we saw really in the past. We certainly didn't see them in any kind of number. Um, clearly the development of, of lab space and, and life sciences space for companies and I think that's going to be important going forward. Launch Labs is hugely important having that space for earlier stage companies to then start and grow and we've got to partner with the real estate industry to make sure we bring the right kind of space onto the market at the right time as the companies kind of uh, grow and expand um, and, and you, you referenced um, uh, Sam's project which EDC was involved in um, Harlem Biospace so that those kind of spaces for the very earliest stage companies I think are, are also important so it's really a combination of all of these things um, to build a cluster that's more mature um, over time. And one thing I would also add to that is I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that we're still 
in somewhat of a, maybe the tail end of an inflection point where Big Pharma, for example, recognized maybe starting 10 or so years ago that being in these isolated clusters in distant lands or, or, or you know, places in New Jersey where they were by themselves in these cloistered communities really wasn't working out that well. I mean, it worked out up until that point. Then you started having huge patent expiries and they had slowed down in R&D and they really recognized, you know, there was this big sea change from those types of environments into major urban environments around major universities where the basic research was happening. And today, something like 75% of all new medicines, therapies uh, that, that uh, pharma companies are putting on the market came from research outside of their own labs. So the importance that we're in today of the, of the partnering of industry and, um, and, and the academic and medical centers is, is really important to recognize, and we have to do everything we can to, to really take advantage of that. And I think you know everybody here is, is trying to do that, but I think if you recognize that as an important thing that's happening, and these are people that are looking to partner and make things happen and, and also help fund research, um, provide translational opportunities for the, some of the great basic research that's happening, uh, you really recognize here's the big picture and why are some of these other things happening and how do we facilitate more access to that? How do we make more things happen? Um, and I think that's an, just another important detail of where we are. So it sounds like people are pretty bullish on the status, New York City status today in this field, but would you say we're over the tipping point? Like at this point, is there, is there no return? Is New York ever going to catch up to Boston? Or, or if we're not at the tipping point, what could, what could trip us up? What are sort of the biggest risks that New York City still faces today? Well, I, I from our perspective at Alexandria, because we're in every other major science market, and as I said, New York is our most nascent, earliest cluster, um, I'd say we're not at the tipping point yet. I mean, I think we've made tremendous strides as a community for all the reasons we've talked about here this morning. I think there's tremendous momentum. Uh, but the industry, I, I remember meeting seven, eight years ago with Elias Zerhouni, and he's the president of R&D at Sanofi, and uh, his office is in Paris, and he was formerly the head of the NIH also. And his perspective then was, look, and I, or excuse me, New York missed the boat 20 years ago, and they're trying to play catch up now. And he was amazed at what we've done. We had him and his entire you know, science team come in, and we did a, a pharma day and really introduced them to a lot of what was going on in the community, and they were blown away and have since then got more and more involved in the community. Um, but that fact that we have been playing catch up, that other places got kind of started first, and a lot of big companies went there, we have a tremendous amount of, you know, I think world-class institutions here, which is clearly the reason we're all sitting here today. I mean, that is the major driver of the life science industry. And what's happening at places like Columbia, you know, Mount Sinai, Sloan Kettering, Rockefeller, while Cornell, NYU, you know, go down the list. I mean, there's an incredible number of organ, you know, institutions here that really make it happen. But we still have a long way to go. I mean, I think the things that were lacking in our eyes and developing all these other science clusters uh, originally was lack of at-risk venture capital, which again is certainly improving. And thank you to groups like Deerfield uh, and several of the other ones that. Um, Warren mentioned earlier, management talent, another major issue. It's one thing to start companies and have great ideas and you need people to run them. It's not often the people who actually start it that know how to make it work from a business standpoint. So that is getting better and, and part of our hypothesis and at the Alexandria Center was bringing in some major companies like Roche, Lilly, Pfizer, and groups like that that bring a lot of seasoned talent with it and people have started you know, flaking off and, and working with a lot of the other uh, organizations. And Calliope is a great example. Uh, Nancy Thornberry, who is the CEO there, and, and Calliope, for those of you who don't know, was a, it's an uh, amazing startup out of Columbia, um, which uh, some of the top scientists in, in the world, in fact, not just New York, uh, are a part of that. Tom Mignanis being one, Charles Zucker, um, Richard, Axel. Richard Axel, so a yeah, really exciting company. Um, but their CEO was, a, a, from Merck, was with Merck for 30 years, um, and she's a very dynamic person. She did, had won a lot of awards and had a lot of uh, very credible things happen at Merck. So it's that marrying together of great science and, and, and these types of entrepreneurs that we really need to continue to see happen.